We're in Luke today. We'll be in Luke for a long time. But we're in Luke today. We start the Gospel of Luke. Um, why don't you stand with me, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, the third Gospel in the New Testament. By the way, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, find one under the chair uh, with you and make sure you take that home with you. We want you to have a Bible, and that's our gift to you. So Luke chapter 1, verses just 1 through 4, which says this. Luke 1, 1 says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this gospel that you have given to us. I thank you for the privilege it is for us to look at it and to study it verse by verse and as we only cover four verses today, help it gloss over the wonderful things that you are teaching us through this book, the historical truth. That is, our Savior lives. Help us rejoice in that. Help us tell others of that. And give us grace as we look at this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Few things are as gripping as a true story. There is a reason so many movies and TV shows start out, you know, with the phrase, based on a true story. You might uh, be familiar with the, the old Dragnet show, and of course that's of an earlier generation, right? <laughs> but at the beginning, if we routinely begin with the lights, ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true, only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. I love true stories. You know, we read these things and we watch them closely all the while thinking to ourselves that, you know, no matter how hard it's going to look, no matter how unusual those events on TV might seem or whatever, that actually happened. And so it intrigues us. Now, obviously, there's a big difference between those stories and the one we begin today in the Gospel of Luke because Luke isn't based on a true story. It's a true story. Amen. You know, what we read here and what we read throughout the Bible is true history, it's actual fact. How true is it? It's so true that you can and that you should bet your life upon it. Now, that's not to say that the book wasn't written with an agenda in mind. It was, and Luke is what we find here up front about his intentions. But the main focus of Luke's agenda is truth. His reader, and we might say readers, needed to know that the gospel which they heard was true, and that's what Luke set out to prove in writing of this work here. We need to know that the gospel is true if we're to believe it, and we must believe it, or we cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, before we jump to the prologue of the book itself, we need to take a look at the backstory, a little look at the, the background of the gospel itself, that Luke wrote the gospel that bears his name is something that's conceded by even the opponents of the gospel. Uh, the text is technically anonymous. You'll never see his name mentioned Nearly every ancient manuscript attests to Luke's authorship. The early church fathers were absolutely unanimous on it. Who was he? Who was Luke? Well, we know him in the New Testament to be a travel companion of Paul's, who is first mentioned by Paul actually in the letter of Colossians. And there Paul describes Luke as his beloved physician, Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Paul also mentions Luke in his very final letter uh, that he sent to Timothy, um, describing as one who remained by his side after everybody else had, had left him in prison. So 2 Timothy 4.11. Those are the only two times his name's mentioned in the Scripture. Where Luke is not mentioned by name is the one place many people would expect to find it, and that's the book of Acts. Luke never identifies himself directly, at least, in either one of his two books, but he is most definitely seen in the book of Acts when the narrative changes from the third person, you know, they did this, to the first person, I, we did this in Acts chapter 16. Uh, at that point, Paul had seen a vision of a man from Macedonia pleading to come over and help them, obviously by sharing the gospel with them in Macedonia, and that's where Luke joins up. If you're familiar with it, this is Paul's second missionary journey, and Luke joins them in the city of Troas. And becomes a off and on travel companion at Paul at that point. Now, some early Christian writers state that Luke was originally from the city of Antioch, which you see over there 
in uh, Syria. There's really no indication of that in the Bible. We don't know that for sure. Um, other than being in Troas, that seems to be where he was from. But wherever he was from, he was likely a Gentile, which is an amazing display of grace from the Lord because this man was responsible for writing over a quarter of the New Testament. Uh, just a little bit of trivia for you. The man who wrote the most in the New Testament was not Paul. It was Luke. Especially realize that Hebrews was not written, most likely not written by Paul. Then Luke is the one who wrote the majority of the, the New Testament. A Gentile of all things. Again, Luke was a physician. His education seen throughout his writing, not only through his medical knowledge, and he pays a great deal of attention to you know, physiological matters as they come up in his books, but also through his excellent Greek, his general attention to detail. We find that his written Greek is virtually in a different class from all other gospel writers and far and above better than Paul's when you read that. His historical details, though, are impeccable. And that wasn't always thought to be the case. For years, historians laughed at Luke, thinking him to be foolish and inaccurate, only to have Luke's account proven true time and time again as more and more archaeological discoveries are made. He truly is an ancient historian of the highest caliber, and uh, his writings provide wonderful evidence of the accuracy that comes from somebody that's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't make mistakes. The Holy Spirit knows history better than any historian does. And so he can inspire perfect writing. Now, as to when Luke wrote his gospel, it's always difficult to pinpoint a precise date with these things, but we do have more hints with the book of Luke and Acts and perhaps with some of the other books out there. It's very possible to date Luke to somewhere in the range of 59 to 60 AD, give or take uh, you know, one or two years either way, with it being the last of the synoptic gospels written. Okay, You've got Mark being first, then Matthew, then, then Luke. Luke shows a heavy reliance on Mark, as does Matthew. He does share some things in common with Matthew as well. But you might ask, well, how do you know it was written so early? How do you know any of those were written so early? Well, it's because it is plainly, the Gospel of Luke is plainly the first part of a two-part series, which is Luke and Acts. And by the way, that's the reason why we jumped from Mark to John, so we could cover Luke and Acts in a two-part series. It'll be a while before we get there, but just so you know what's the future is coming for us. The book of Acts begins by directly referring to this gospel, tying it in with the book, and we know that Acts ends with a very specific time frame. Paul is shown in Acts you know, 28, uh, arriving in Rome, 27 I guess, arriving in Rome as a part of his Roman imprisonment, which can be dated around 61 A.D., now, from Paul's letters, we know that he was later rearrested. He was, you know, historically, of course, we know he was executed during the reign of Caesar Nero, no later than 67 to 68 AD. But Luke, in his writings, has zero mention of Paul's death, zero mention of any future imprisonment. And this seems very unusual for someone who was so familiar with Paul's travel and wrote about them in such detail. It's so unusual for Luke not to mention it that. Any argument for a date past Paul's death simply stretches that argument beyond credibility. Thus, Acts was lightly written around 61 to 62 AD when Paul arrived there in Rome, which pushes Luke's gospel to no later than 59 to 60 AD. FYI, that also means Matthew had to have been written earlier than Luke, and Mark written even earlier than that. Thus, the earliest gospel accounts dates back to barely a decade or so after Jesus' resurrection. Now, in ancient terms, that's basically covering current events. Okay, It's incredibly close. So, that's when he wrote it. What was it that Luke wrote? Well, he wrote of a Jesus who's the Savior of the world. If Matthew wrote to Jews and Mark wrote primarily to Romans, then Luke wrote to Gentiles. The same Messiah who's the King of the Jews is the King of the world. The same Christ who's the Son of David is also the Son of Adam. God's plan for salvation through Jesus is first given to Israel, but it's bigger than ethnic Israel. God's plan of salvation through Jesus is his plan for all the world. And that's what Luke emphasizes over and over, which is probably fitting considering his own Gentile background. Luke shows Jesus seeking and saving the lost, and that's a constant theme throughout the gospel. Jesus is shown reaching out to those who are purposefully forgotten by the religious leaders the religious hypocrites of the day, be them women or diseased or beggars or Gentiles, Jesus loved them all, and he showers them with practical expressions of his compassion. He heals them, he feeds them, he loves them, and he proclaimed to all of them the good news of the kingdom. None were left out, 
Jesus had been sent for all of them. Now, that's still the good news, of course, that we proclaim. When we tell people about Jesus, we don't have to worry and wonder if Jesus actually came for that person. Maybe he came for his neighbor, but not for that person. We don't have to worry about that. Jesus did come for that person. There's not a single person in all the world that God does not desire to hear the gospel and have faith, which also tells us there's no lack of opportunity for us to go out and tell them about it. As to why Luke wrote his gospel, well, that's what he explains here in his prologue or his introduction. And it's really in written in some of the finest written Greek in all the New Testament. Luke tells his friend Theophilus exactly why he's writing. He wants Theophilus to know that this is all true. We believe in a trustworthy gospel. Now, it's all one sentence in Greek. We're going to break it up in chunks, looking at the events here uh, of the, the gospel narrative, what he says about these events here. First, what others had done. Secondly, what Luke did. And third, what we might know. First is what others had done in verses 1 and 2. And as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the gospels delivered them to us, or ministers of the word delivered them to us. The first thing we see here about the events, the events, they were written. They were written. Others had written prior to Luke. Luke was well aware of those accounts. Right from the get-go, Luke is quick to give credit to others who had gone before him. Now, he doesn't downgrade the others. He doesn't think less of them. On the contrary, he's basically applauding them here. Praise God, right, for those who had spoken of the gospel and written of the gospel before. Praise God that it went out through the lips and oral tradition and went out through the pens and written tradition of other people. If it was all dependent upon Luke, if it was all dependent on any of us, (laughs) as a single individual, that would be a sad state indeed. And it's a good reminder that we are not alone within the body of Christ, And we ought to praise God for others who proclaim the truth. Now, we might not agree with 100% of everything somebody else says, but if we agree on the essentials of Jesus, that's enough. Now, as for Luke, he did agree, of course, with the other gospel writers. And how do you know it? Well, because he quotes them so much. He incorporates their material. It's hard to agree with someone to a greater extent than by quoting them. And that's basically what he does for a lot of his gospel. By the way, about this, There were many other so-called Christian books out there besides what we find in the New Testament. Uh, Keep in mind that not everyone who wrote a so-called gospel wrote a book that can be trusted. But the ones that Luke read did, right? They were right. They could be trusted. After Luke and after John wrote, many others wrote really heretical gospels, primarily out of uh, the school of thought known as Gnosticism. And the so-called Gospels of Thomas, of Mary, of Philip, and of Judas are all heretical, as is the Gospel of Peter, which isn't necessarily Gnostic, but it's still false. And these are quoted all the time. And they're incorporated into some very famous movies, some that were released pretty recently, too. Uh, These are ancient writings that, you know, they claim someone famous as their author, but they have no evidence of the fact, probably written a couple hundred years after the fact of these people living. They often contradict the canonical gospels in the New Testament filled with all kinds of errors. And again, they get a lot of press from literal media outlets. They're presented as being, you know, lost gospels that are on par with the biblical gospels. Now, we can know this much without a doubt. There are no lost gospels, all right? The books that are contained with our New Testaments are the books recognized by the early church as having the stamp of the Holy Spirit upon them which are inspired and which are without error in their entirety. And they say they're lost, but there's so few that exist. Well, there's a reason why so few copies of those Gnostic Gospels exist. The church saw right through them. They knew they were wrong, and they didn't want to bother trying to keep them around, right? But with the true Gospels, they went to painstaking efforts to ensure that these writings were copied again and again and again because they wanted these books to get into as many hands as possible, Why? Because these books contain the truth of God regarding Jesus Christ. These books contain the good news of God's salvation. So we want to read these books and believe. So these events were written. We also see here that the events were fulfilled. The word chosen by Luke has a history outside of the New Testament of referring to the finishing of legal or financial matters. They have been fulfilled among us. These things were fully accomplished, fully completed, In regards to the gospel account, he refers to the fact that these events that surrounded Jesus were brought to a solid conclusion. These weren't open-ended questions or mysteries. These things were done. They were known. 
Specifically, they were accomplished, they were fulfilled among us, he says. Jesus' ministry wasn't done in secret. It wasn't done behind closed doors. The resurrection wasn't revealed to just one or two men who were conspiring together. These things took place in front of everyone. Everyone knew. And that takes us to the next point because these events were not only fulfilled, they were verified. There were, what he says, eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Now, Luke had not been one of them, right? He was a second-generation believer, not a first-generation believer. But there were many first-generation believers and eyewitnesses. They personally experienced these things for themselves. Luke's own companion, Paul, was himself an eyewitness in his own right. Paul may not have walked with Jesus during his earthly ministry, but he definitely was a first-hand witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus appeared to him. It was because Jesus appeared to Paul that Paul even became a Christian in the first place, right? And it was these witnesses that Luke interviewed to great extent, something he gets to here in verse 3, And so even though Luke himself wasn't there, there were many others who were, and their accounts were true. They were verifiable. Because someone didn't believe Luke, guess what? They could do the same investigation for themselves, talk to the same people, and come up with the same answers. So these events were fulfilled. These events were delivered. They were delivered. Luke and others were the stewards of what was given to them. When he wrote of eyewitnesses, he also wrote of what? Ministers and servants of which he himself could possibly be included. These servants were handed the word. By the way, it's logos here, but it's used in a different context than John does. They were handed the word, they were handed the gospel, and they passed it on. They served the Lord by serving others, hand-delivering the message of Christ to them. By the way, it's the exact same with us, because we, again, are saved by this gospel. We are kept by this gospel, but we're not to keep this gospel to ourselves. Stewards use what it is that has been entrusted to them. Think of it from another point of view. If a heart surgeon didn't use the knowledge he or she has to save someone's life, it would be downright criminal. They have knowledge that saves a life. We have knowledge that saves souls. Use it. Share it. Be a steward of it and pass it on. So that's what others did. What did Luke do? Verse 3, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. So why another gospel? If if other books had been written, why would another be necessary? And again, Luke's not downgrading or, you know, degrading, downplaying the people who had written before him. He was simply adding to what it is that had already been done. And it is that addition that's the key here, because the gospel of Luke does contain elements that are totally unique, unseen in Matthew, unseen in Mark, unseen in John, for that matter. You know, without Luke, we would know nothing about the birth history of John the Baptist. We'd know nothing about the background and the history of Mary. In fact, we'll find that even Luke's genealogy of Jesus follows Mary's lineage, not Joseph's. That's what Matthew did. Luke contains teachings of Jesus that are found nowhere else. Some of the most famous teachings that we know of Jesus are only in Luke, the Good Samaritan in chapter 10, the rich fool who built his many barns in chapter 12, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, prodigal son, and chapter 15, the teaching of the rich man and Lazarus. Well, that's chapter 16. That's all only in Luke. Those are some among the the most famous teachings of Jesus, but you can't find them in any of the other gospels. And beyond the birth history of Jesus from Mary's perspective, Luke's the only gospel writer to give any account at all of Jesus's own childhood, providing the story of Jesus in the temple. Luke's the one who tells us of the raising of the widow's son in chapter 7. He's the one who tells us of, uh, you know, there was a wee little man, wee little man named Zacchaeus in chapter 19. He's the one who tells us of Luke's, of Jesus' trial before Herod in chapter 23. Nobody else does that. The famous story of the thief on the cross who's repented, that's in Luke alone, chapter 23. His post-resurrection walk to Emmaus, chapter 24, much more. So yes, others had written of the gospel, but the church would be far poorer without Luke's gospel. By the way, similar questions are often asked of uh, the church. Why, why are more churches needed? There's so many out there. There are so many gospels. Why write another one? There's so many churches out there. Why plant another one? Luke understood that all those others had written. He still had something to offer. Well, it's likewise with churches. Other congregations might be there, but there's still something to offer. There's still more to do. We've got to be careful because church planners do need to be careful not to build a work on someone else's foundation. Romans 15, 20, Paul made that clear. You know, to simply shuffle believers around from building to building, that's not the goal. 
But as long as there are people who are unsaved, as long as there are people who are undiscipled, there is still a need for more churches. Think of it this way. If there's still people in a city who need to know Jesus, then there's still a need for someone to reach them for Christ. Every building in, that has a, a church placard out front might be full, but there'd still be thousands of people in Tyler. Not enough churches yet. Not for this town. So these events were researched as well. They were researched. The word Luke uses to describe this point is interesting. And I think the, the New King James editors actually paraphrase a bit. They translate it as having had a perfect understanding. And literally the word for understanding here means to trace, to follow, to investigate carefully. The idea is to follow a course of events, to check something out. You know, some people follow politics. Some people follow football. Luke followed the events of Jesus, right? He had researched things. He had done his homework. He wasn't a novice to all of this. He wasn't just spouting ideas and opinions from the top of his head. He knew exactly what it was that he wrote because he had followed these things for quite some time. This is evident in the abundance of the material that's unique in his gospel. He's quite the historian and researcher. He seems to have personally interviewed Mary at length. He interviewed the parents of John the Baptist and who knows how many other people. And he certainly had the time to do it. Remember, he traveled with Paul, but he was an off-and-on companion with Paul. There are certain points in the narrative of Acts where after Luke joins in, of course, he, he's writing in the first person, but there's other times after that point, he goes back to writing in the third person, even after he joins up. And obviously, we can't say with any certainty what Luke was doing during that time, but it's not a stretch to suggest that you know he was very intrigued with all of these stories he was hearing from Paul and from others, and so he uses whatever downtime he has to go research these things on his own. A perfect opportunity for Luke would have been while Paul was in prison in Caesarea for two years. You might recall that you know, Felix was just kind of delaying things, waiting for a bribe in Acts chapter 24. Well, that goes to third person at that point. So it would have been you know, relatively easy for Luke to travel very close to Judea and conduct his historical research at that time and write his book. But whenever he did it, the point is that he did, and that's what's included here in this gospel. You might say, well, so what? Well, so the things we read here, the things we read elsewhere in the Bible are not made up. They're not imaginary fairy tales. They're not mythologies, you know, to try to cover up basic ignorance. These are real historical accounts of real historical people. These things really happened. These people really existed. There really was a man named Jesus of Nazareth who was born of a virgin, healed the sick, raised the dead, showed compassion to the poor, confronted religious hypocrites, suffered on the cross, died, and rose from the grave on the third day. All of it really happened. Not just a nice story, it's historical truth, and we'll see more of that in verse 4. The other thing we see here before moving on is that these events were organized. They were organized. He says that he wrote an orderly account. Luke isn't interested in just spouting off as many facts as possible. He not only did his research, but he took the time and effort to organize it in such a way that his writing could be understood. Now, what makes this interesting is that Luke doesn't tell us how he organized the account, just that he did so. Now, generally speaking, the flow of the gospel narratives are all the same, and we see it here uh, with Luke. You know, we'll find that he starts with his childhood, chapters 1 and 2, if you're we're with us in Route 66. You're familiar with this diagram here, how he had a general Galilean ministry in the first half of the book, basically. You've got the journey to Jerusalem, which takes up basically the majority of the second half of the book. And then finally, the events suffering, uh, surrounding his you know, suffering, death, and resurrection. Generally speaking, that's what we find here. And generally speaking, that's what you find in Matthew and Mark as well. However, the details within these broad sections are different. There are times that Luke follows Mark's order of events closer than Matthew. There's other times that he completely diverges from it. Now, this isn't error. This is evidence. It's evidence of his organization. Luke and all of the gospel writers had reasons why they wrote, and they brought out certain themes along the way. For instance, Matthew obviously wanted to show how Jesus fulfilled Jewish prophecy. And so some of the features of his organization was to demonstrate this happening time and time and time again. As for Luke, his overall theme was to show how the perfect man brings redemption to all the world. And so the events that he chose and how he arranged it serve to demonstrate this. And the key is to remember that although the gospel accounts contain biographical information about Jesus, they are not biographies. Okay? Each one of these books were written with a purpose. 
primarily that of evangelism. You might recall just a couple of weeks ago, we were finishing out the Gospel of John, and John made this point explicit in his book. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, that's not just true of the fourth gospel. That's true of absolutely all of them. They chose certain events so that we might believe. Of course, the obvious follow-up question is, do you believe? Do you believe what's been written? Do you believe the testimonies you've been told? You know, when Luke did his research, he read what had been written in the past. He spoke to people whose lives had been transformed. Perhaps he even spoke to those who were opposed to Jesus. All the evidence was there. He just needed to let it be heard so it would be believed. And Maybe you're here and you've been on the fence about Jesus for a while, and it's time to get off the fence and make a decision. It's time to actually assess the evidence for yourself and admit the evidence is abundant. Too many things have proven true. Too many lives have been forever changed, all because of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, there's hypocrites. Yes, there are. There are liars. There are hypocrites. And guess what? They were soundly condemned by Jesus. Don't blame Jesus for the failings of his followers. Can't blame a stovetop for someone's burn if we're the one that put our hand to it when it's on, if we ignore the heat. Neither can we blame Christ when purported Christians ignore his commands. Today it's time to examine the evidence and to believe. By the way, before we leave verse 3, who's Theophilus? Well, both Luke's gospel and the book of Acts begin with the dedication to Theophilus. Many people through the centuries have wondered who he was. The very short answer is, we don't know. <laughs> but because I'm teaching, I'm going to give you a longer answer. <laughs> it's possible he was some sort of Roman official. Judging by the a title that Luke gives him here, addresses him with most excellent Theophilus, considering that some scholars theorize that Acts was written as a legal defense of Paul, it's possible that, you know, Theophilus was one of the officials assigned to investigate the charges against him. We don't know, though. At the same time, Theophilus very basically means lover of God or beloved of God. So others suggest this could be a cryptic reference to a, perhaps a single Christian who was a wealthy patron of Luke or maybe a, a reference to all Christians who would, you know, read this. And again, there's just no way of knowing. Uh, the name was fairly common uh, by some accounts in the Roman Empire. So without information, we just can't know anymore. It is a really cool name, though. i got to admit, my very first band that I was ever in was named Theophilus after this. So i got a pretty nice affinity to it. So that's, that's what Luke did. But what can we know? We, <laughs> we see what we know through verse 4. That you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. The next thing we know about these events is that they were taught. You were instructed. Whoever Theophilus was, he was instructed in these things. He had heard some things about Jesus already and seemingly wanted to know more. And it emphasizes that not only had there been teachers and ministers and stewards of the word, there had also been students. There had been people willing to listen. You know, so often we operate under the assumption of the opposite. Christians hesitate to share the gospel because, you know, we're afraid nobody's going to listen. And it's true, some people are going to reject the news. It's true, some people are going to resist the news actively. Some people will ignore it, but guess what? Some will listen. Some will receive it gladly. When Jesus taught the parable of the soils, remember, he spoke of one soil out of four that received the same seed, the word, the gospel, and actually bore fruit. When Paul shared the gospel from city to city in the Roman Empire, he was rejected far more often then he was received. He was rejected, sure, but some received, right? Of course, if, if it happened with them, why would we think it'd be any different with us? As if, you know, they could reject Paul, but not us. <laughs> we're more skilled at sharing the gospel than Paul. Of course, we're going to expect that. Yes, the gospel will be denied, but not always. And Theophilus is proof that it wasn't always denied. Guess what? So are you. You're proof that the gospel isn't always denied. If you receive the gospel... Why be so quick to think that someone else will not? Surely someone else will receive it as well. And I would suggest that part of our problem with evangelism isn't so much the fear of rejection, but the lack of faith for success. Some people will believe. We need to start with that expectation and go out from there. So these events were taught. These events finally were also true. True. 
And this is the bottom line. This is the ultimate reason Luke wrote. He wanted Theophilus to know that the things he heard were things that were true. Theophilus could safely put his trust in the work that he'd heard of Jesus. His salvation would be secure in Christ. Safety, security, that's the idea here of certainty. When we say we have a certain hope in Jesus, we're talking about a solid bedrock truth. The gospel, again, it isn't wishful thinking, it is proclaimed fact. We believe in certain historic, verifiable truth. And some people raise their hand with an objection at that point and say, that's a big claim, preacher. How exactly can someone verify an event from 2,000 years ago? How can you be sure this is actual history as opposed to just another religious story, just another religious myth? It's a good question. It's an important question. It's a question not a lot of believers can answer. It's one thing to know what we believe, It's another thing to know why we believe it, what reason we have for believing it. Luke's whole purpose in writing was to provide certain historical proof of the gospel that had been taught. If we cannot know, then the gospel in which we believe is true, what's the point of believing? Why give our lives to Jesus if we cannot trust him? At that point, he's just as useful as Zeus or Yoda or the flying spaghetti monster. (laughs) Whatever figment of your imagination. Jesus has to be real if he can be trusted, and he is. First, Jesus historically lived. He historically lived. That ought to go without saying, but it seems that today, more and more people today are trying to cast doubt on the man of Jesus actually existing in the past. Now, I've just got to be blunt about this. That position is sheer ignorance. Sheer ignorance. Even honest, atheistic scholars acknowledge the historical existence of Jesus. Not only do the four Gospels, the book of Acts, the entire letters of the New Testament witness of him, by the way, that's all valid testimony, it's what we call primary sources, the church fathers witness of him, but Jesus is also mentioned in several ancient non-Christian historians as well. Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Josephus, each mention Jesus. The Babylonian Talmud actually mentions Jesus by name. There is vastly more historical evidence for Jesus' existence than most individuals from history that we just take for granted. So Jesus historically lived. Jesus historically died. You say, well, that's stating the obvious. (laughs) Everybody dies. But it's the manner in which Christ dies that matters. Jesus of Nazareth suffered and died the death of the cross. And again, this is attested not only in the New Testament and the church fathers, but in some of those same non-Christian sources. There is no credible argument against Jesus' death by crucifixion. Now, what makes this so important is the lack of a credible charge against him. There is zero indication that Jesus is ever thought of as a criminal or that he raised an army. Yet he was crucified as an enemy of Rome under the charge that he's the king of the Jews. This is exactly what the Bible prophesied would happen, Psalm 23, among other places. And it plays out with Jesus. Why would Rome kill a supposed king who wasn't a threat? All of that gives credibility to the gospel account. He historically lived. He historically died. He historically rose from the grave. And of course, this is far more important. After all, it doesn't matter if Jesus lived and died if he never lived again. He'd just be another man in history, inconsequential to the rest of us. And even the Bible goes so far to say that if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, then all of our faith in him is futile. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. Jesus did rise. People saw him dead. They saw him buried. The Romans certified his death. His burial in the garden tomb was not only witnessed, but it was sealed. It was guarded. The Jewish leaders went to great lengths precisely to prevent rumors of resurrection. Yet on Sunday morning, Jesus rose. The Romans guard failed in their duties, and they lived to tell the tale, which is proof that they were lying, because if they were telling the truth, they should have been killed. The Jewish leaders and the priests vehemently resisted the disciples, but never once do they contradict them on Jesus' resurrection. 3,000 people in Jerusalem put their faith in Jesus on the day of Pentecost, just 50 days after Jesus was crucified at the insistence of the people in the same city. They knew Jesus was risen because they had seen the evidence for themselves. And this is all in addition to the various physical appearances of Jesus, to the women at the tomb, to the apostles several times, to the men on the road, to Emmaus, to over 500 people at once, to the personal appearance, to Paul, to James, the Lord's brother, and others. You know, to those who say, well, it's all a conspiracy. 
How can an ancient conspiracy survive that many people? Paul had no reason to convert, nor did the people of Jerusalem. They'd actively been opposed to Jesus, so something had to happen to drastically change their minds, and something did. Jesus was risen from the dead. And beyond those initial days and those initial weeks, nothing changed in their story. The apostles are tortured, they're jailed, they're killed for their faith, and not once do they change their testimony that Jesus is risen. Two people knock over a grocery store in town, they're caught. They'll often change their stories to change their circumstances and avoid consequences. The apostles faced far worse, and they didn't change one bit. There's only one reasonable conclusion from it all. Jesus literally rose from the dead. He's alive. And if he did, what does that mean? It means everything else is true. If Jesus rose from the dead, everything he taught is accurate. Everything he demonstrated is true. It means that he is God and that we must have faith in him in order to see the kingdom of God. And so it means he does offer eternal life. It means that we must repent from our sins and believe upon him in order to receive it. And this isn't even to begin to examine how Jesus historically fulfilled prophecy, over 300 of them in the Old Testament. Does it begin to look at how the writings of the New Testament are astonishingly accurate and historically preserved, far more than any document ever written? The, the events of Jesus are true. This is something on which we can base our lives. And so we read the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke is a trustworthy gospel. Do you believe it? Over the next many months, we're going to have a wonderful opportunity to study it verse by verse. But all of these wonderful events and stories mean nothing if they're just stories. If it's all a bunch of fictional, feel-good stuff, it's still just fiction in the end. It wouldn't be trustworthy. We wouldn't have any hope in Jesus. But it's not. Luke was intentionally careful to examine the evidence before him, to research it, think it through, write it out, and present it in such a way that Theophilus could know that it is true, and it is. The gospel we believe is the true gospel, and through it we receive everlasting life. We have our sins forgiven. We look forward to a glorious eternity with the Lord Jesus. The gospel, of course, is the good news of Jesus himself, and we can trust every single thing that the Bible proclaims of him. He really did live, die for our sins, and rise from the dead. It is certifiably true. Of course, it's not just something we merely receive. It's something we're supposed to give out as well. It's not just the gospel we believe. It's the gospel we proclaim. We may not be eyewitnesses of the original events of Jesus, but we are witnesses to the things we have experienced. You're in this room, and if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, then you have been personally transformed by the living God. And you can speak as an eyewitness of your own testimony. And in addition, we are still ministers. We're still stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the same message that spoke of the God who transformed us is the message that we can give out to others. So we need to give it out. We need to pass it out, send it on. Know that there will be some who listen. It won't be everyone, but there will be someone. That someone needs to know the truth. That someone needs to be saved. God specifically equipped you to go tell that someone, so go tell them. Ask to be renewed by God the Holy Spirit, directed by Him, and then ask for the faith, the courage, and the conviction to follow through as you do it. Today, in this room, you, you might be that someone. Maybe you've considered the claims of the gospel in the past, but you know, it was just in passing. Maybe you had a really bad experience in church, some other reason to doubt the claims of Christianity. Today, put those doubts to rest. The gospel of Jesus Christ is trustworthy. It's true. Jesus did die for you, and he did rise from the grave. And you can put your faith and your trust in him, receive the promise of everlasting life. In Luke's second book, he records the word of Paul and Silas to their Philippian jailer when he's asking how to be saved. And he records Paul and Silas saying this in Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. It's that simple. You can be saved today. And you can know it without a shadow of a doubt when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you have that opportunity right now. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for the opportunity you give people to be saved. I thank you for the wonderful, true account of Jesus that is contained in the Bible. That is the gospel that we proclaim. And I do pray 
Lord, for those who may be here today who have not yet put their faith and their trust in Jesus. Perhaps they considered it in the past, but they never took that step of faith. Perhaps they've downplayed it in the past and didn't think it was for them. But Lord, in this time, in this moment, they're convicted that it's true and it is for them. And they too can be saved if they simply respond to your free offer of grace. Help them do that right now. Help them turn to you asking, Jesus, save me. I do believe. I believe you're God who died for me at the cross. I believe that you rose from the grave. Help me, Lord, leave my sins in the past. I confess them to you, and I confess I need to be saved, so please save me. Lord, you give them the words that they need in this moment to cry out to you asking for your grace and your salvation. And I thank you for your promise that you give it. As Paul says, if you believe with all your heart, you will be saved. Thank you, Lord, for that opportunity to believe. Lord, for the rest of us, we believed upon that gospel. Now help us proclaim that gospel. Help us be assured of that gospel in which we have believed, knowing that we have reason to believe. It is trustworthy. And that same gospel that saved us can save others too. So use us, Lord, to preach the good news of Jesus to this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.